Okay, another live. Here we go every single night. Uh, live on Instagram. Uh, let me get my mic ready. Oh, I've got enough leeway in that cable, I do. And let's get this up. Okay, where are we? We're here. Okay, look at this. We're live, we're live. A little bit towards that way, I think we're good. Jerry D. Minton, good to see you. First in the gate, or uh, well, second in the gate, technically, if you count. Anyway, um, hope you're all well. Good to see everyone who's going to be joining in. Um, Kathleen, been a while. Hope you're well. We've all, we all lead very busy lives. I had a great chat with Kathleen the other morning. Um, Kathleen, by the way, for those who don't know, runs uh, Nip of Courage. Great independent um, Aussie spirits distributor is the best way to put it. But, um, you know, distributors these days aren't just distributors. Not, if you think of a distributor these days as just a warehouse sending out stock, it's, it's far more than that. And it it's, involves so many aspects of the business which are complicated and fascinating. So, uh, I, I, it's, uh, seriously, I'm ad in admiration of what Kathleen does. I always have been. In fact, Kathleen was one of the early, was one of the early pioneer people in my field. Uh, in my field. This is like, uh, Kathleen was one of the first people I met in the spirits industry. She may not remember this, but I can, that's a funny little story anyway. I think it was her, maybe her first year of, uh, with uh, running Nib of Courage. And uh, she presented me a whiskey, which was... Uh, <laughs> Kathleen, I hope I'm not embarrassing you too much with this story. Um, but you um, you served me up a, um, uh, a whiskey at the Oak Barrel Whiskey Fair. And this must have been a very early iteration of the fair as well. But it was... Um, it was a Queensland whiskey called Big Black Cock. Uh, I know you don't distribute them anymore, but um, <laughs> they were. There was a yellow tipped one and a pink tipped one, and the pink one was the work in progress. And I thought it was very good, actually. I thought it was pretty good for what it was. Uh, not good enough to really get a bottle though, because for me it was sort of a, it was a bit young, it was a bit sort of a bit brash, and it's hard to make good whiskey in Queensland. Uh, they make good rum, as we know, but they don't make great whiskey. I think it's a, a lot comes down to climate and. Um, the team and people and whatnot. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no! You weren't teaching me how to drink whiskey. I was already well versed in that, but you you did give me a glass of um, Big Black Cock, which uh, is you know probably one of the more uh, incendiary entitled whiskies out there. I think I got a bit of hay fever tonight. Actually, I'm a bit uh, a bit fuzzy tonight, so I do apologise in advance if I sneeze a few times or not at all. Um, what are we doing tonight? Tonight I'm going to drink a dram of um. Uh, I agree. <laughs> you must swallow always. <laughs> yeah, big black cock. You gotta swallow every time, right? <laughs> so inappropriate. <laughs> Good to see you both in here. Okay. Um Dave Miller, hope you're well. Mouthfeel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yikes. <laughs> Tonight I want to talk a little about two things. One is Campbelltown, and one is um, unfiltered. But let's talk about Campbelltown to begin with. Campbelltown, I'm talking about the region of Campbelltown in Scotch whiskey, not um, Western Sydney. Campbelltown is probably one of the most fascinating regions in whiskey anywhere in the world. Now, you know, let's talk about wine for a second. Certain wine regions in, in the wine trade are considered sort of, you know, like holy grail regions and wine collectors and wine appreciators and wine drinkers all get very sort of, you know, get very excited over certain regionalities of, um, of wine. So if you say to some, you know, wine drinkers, in Australia, you might say something like, um, you might say Hunter Valley wines and people go, yeah, you know, right, okay. And you say, oh, Barossa wine and they're like, oh, you know, or Tasmanian Pinot. It's like, oh, you know, sort of like this. Uh, sort of different regions of wine. Even in France, it's sort of like, um, you know, things like, um, um, in, so in, in France, it might be something like, you know, Bordeaux um, over certain other regions and people obsess over those regionalities in wine, just like they do in spirit, just like they do in whiskey. And that's why there's, you know, different nations that make whiskey in these days, of course, you know, whiskey can be made anywhere and these days is made everywhere. Um, whether it be bourbon whiskey, Scotch whiskey, world whiskey, where Australian whiskey, Indian whiskey, whatever it is, um, world whiskey—it's a bit of a funny phrase, isn't it? World whiskey. What does that mean? It means whiskey that's made on Earth. Whiskey that's not Scotch whiskey. I don't know. It's kind of a funny phrase. I find it's like, oh, there's you know, we always categorise it as Scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey, American whiskey, 
on world after that. I guess that's a nice sort of catch-all term for, for you know, non-mainstream whiskies in some ways. Um, Cocktail Amy and Petrino11 joined. Good to see you both. So let's just talk about Campbelltown, Scotland as a region of Scotland. Um, it's a small region. It's a very small area, it's Campbelltown. You can walk from one end of it to the other in about 20 minutes. It's, it's not a big walk. It's not a big region. And it used to be the whiskey-making capital of Scotland. There used to be at some point, and I'm going to get this number wrong, but I remember it, there, was, there was a documentation that at some point there were like 100 or so, or 80 or 100 operating distilleries in, uh, in Campbelltown. I found some old NLA maps, um, some historical maps, which showed things like the, uh, the, um, uh, the Kintyre distillery and the... Uh, uh, they're all these sort of like names, that like obviously quite quite Scottish names, but all these like names of all these little distilleries, all within a, all in a row, like all making spirit. And I'd love to be a fly on the wall. I'd love to travel back in time and taste what they were doing then. I'm sure most of it wasn't very good, but a lot of it would have been quite good as well. Um, but they they these distilleries sort of founded at certain times and then collapsed at other times as well. And when the Great Whiskey collapsed, the first Great Whiskey collapse came along. Um, they were the first to bear the brunt of it. They were the first to sort of like close up shops. And now to this day, there's only three operating distilleries and two of them are run by the same company. So there's three operating distilleries in Campbelltown, yet they are iconic these days. So you've got Springbank Distillery, you've got Glen Guile Distillery, and you've got Glen Scotia Distillery. So Glen Guile is owned by Springbank, or owned by j and Mitchell, I should say, the parent company. Um, so Jane and Mitchell own Springbank and they own Glengyle. Glengyle is much a much smaller operation. They're both very small, mind you, and they're both very much handmade whiskey from top to bottom, from barley to bottle kind of situations. Um, they're, they're both, I believe. Uh, Glen, I don't know enough about Glengyle to be honest, but they um, they both um, malt their own barley. Uh, they all, they all malt their own barley there, uh, or at least a portion of it, I should say, not all of it. Um, uh, and yeah, they are producing a uh, remarkable whiskey that is now getting the attention much more in the last sort of 10 years of uh, malt connoisseurs and people interested in whiskey because they are sort of, they produce a regionality, a certain flavor and profile of whiskey that is desirable and collectors love and people love to, love to drink and love to enjoy. So I want to talk about um, that for a moment and just talk about how that region, it's, it's Campbelltown is quite a, um, it's quite a working class area. It's quite a blue collar area. The docks, the shipping area, the um, the distilleries, um, very little local trade, a little bit here and there, um, you know, sort of a couple of hotels and restaurants, but it's very small. It is like a country town. It is. It's if you've ever been to somewhere like even like it makes it, play, it makes even like uh, Newcastle look massive, or in comparison, or um, uh, even Geelong look even massive again. It's very very small. I don't know what to compare it to an Australian town in size. Maybe something like uh, Forster. Or something like that up on the coast um, would be a, would be comparable because um, it's just it's very small. Um, so, but it's a lovely part of the world and has a certain aroma. The area has an aroma. There's a smell in the air in Campbelltown which is uh, which is remarkable. It's certain, it's almost like a farmyardy kind of smell which you get in a lot of their whiskies. So obviously you know these cast breathing over time and absorbing the terroir of the area. If that is if that's a thing. And I, I will talk about terroir another night. Some people believe it, some people don't. Um, so that was sort of, that was really where I want to start off tonight. We're talking about Campbelltown, which is why I'm going to talk about one whiskey, which I've personally bought a bottle of, and this is this is it, um, of 93.99, Drambleton Lock. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this particular bottling, it is not in the current outturn. It came out a couple of months ago. Um, it's been around for a few, couple of months now, at least. Um... 93.99, it's a 15-year-old um, single cask from Distillery 93 in um, in Campbelltown. Now, I'm not going to reveal the distillery name for you, but I'll make it really easy. Ready? Distillery 27 is Springbank. Distillery 90... And we don't have a code for Glengyle. So it's the other one. <laughs> uh, yeah, Whiskey Sec, it's true. It's, I was surprised how small it was as well. Uh, I was surprised how small Campbelltown was. It's a, it's a tiny little area, really. It's um, Le Cabio Joint, good to see you. It's it's a tiny little area, but it, it's it's a lovely area, and there's, there's some really nice places to get a nice dinner. Uh, there's a couple of nice pubs, the Black Sheep, of course, uh, which is a classic uh, pub. Uh, we couldn't even stay in the Black Sheep though because it was when we when I was there. It was during Campbelltown Malt Festival, 
and it was so busy. I mean, well, you know, not like inner city busy on New Year's Eve kind of busy, but busy. It was very busy, uh, busy time of year to be there. And so it's sort of like being in that area is very. Um, we thought, oh, we'll get the you know the the big the big haggis dish. The, they do this um, uh, haggis nachos at uh, uh, nachos at. Um, uh, had the black sheep, I've been told. I've never had them now, and I still haven't had them because it was way too busy when we were there. And we walked into the pub and we were squeezed up against a the wall. There were no tables. They said, oh, I'd be about an hour and an hour and a half wait to get a table. It's like, oh. So we went and had dinner elsewhere. We ended up eating dinner much later that night instead because we had to go back to the hotel to do a film shoot. Um, and uh, anyway, we ended up eating at this uh, rather, eh, rather average Indian area restaurant later that night. But you know, it wasn't that late. It was like, you know, maybe 8, 8.30, but um, it certainly was a, it was a big night. I'm going to take the top off that. Now, the reason why I'm t- the nachos were fantastic, don't tell me that now, Whiskey Sec. I didn't get a chance to have them. It was, it's too, <laughs> it was too busy. Damn it. I personally, you know what? I, I generally don't play favorites. You know that by now. Um, those who watch this know I don't play favorites, as in like, I, I, I can find redeeming characters in all casks especially all of our panel approved casks that I go, you know what, I really like that or I really like that. So there's different sort of different angles I take with them. And some flavor profiles I preference over others personally, but that's subjective, of course. Um, I preference oily and coastal quite a bit. I think I make, I think that what we put in the oily and coastal profile are lovely. They're often quite lightly peated, but really sort of more coastal and oily rather than, and almost like sea waves and things like the kind of distillery profile you'd find out of something like 93 out of or like a 23 or even a uh, there's so many just codes we use it for obviously but it's not, it's not code dependent but it is um those coastal kind of drams even stuff like distillery uh four distillery three i'm going to pour a dram of that now the reason why i'm pouring this 93.99 i'm going to pour myself a generous measure of that um is because this is in my opinion i'm making this call now and you've heard it here first and i hate making calls on just on whiskies that are, i know there aren't many left uh this is my favorite Campbelltown whiskey of the year and up there is one of my favorite scotch whiskies of the year I think it's remarkable I'll read the I'll read I honestly think it's one of the most balanced lovely casks we've ever had it says on the front here a dram that could only have come from Campbelltown pure peaty earthy medicinal wacky fruity and coastal bam totally broad in other words uh, distilled 7th of February 2003 refill ex bourbon hogshead from Campbelltown at 55.3% aged 15 years. One of 274 bottles. These teenage uh, casks, and even some of the 11, 12 year old ones we get out of 93, I think are some of the most underrated whiskies. And I honestly think, um, <laughs> I'll get to that question, Lockie. Uh, I honestly think that sometimes we, uh, as, as Campbelltown whiskey lovers, as people who love that region, they go a bit gaga over Springbank. And I, I love Springbank, don't get me wrong, I think it's a fantastic distillery. In fact, they produce some of my favorite whiskeys. But I think we look at some we look at some of those from Springbank and we go, um, oh yeah, that's the best. It's like it's almost like Springbank's one of those distilleries that almost has probably has the highest cult-like following, maybe next to Ardbeg, of a distillery that's that's operating. I mean, yes, people have this cult-like status around things like Brora and Port Allen and Banff and stuff like that. Maybe not so much Banff. Banff is only really sort of really nerdy stuff. But like, or maybe even Convil Moore or something like that. The distilleries that have closed, that people go, oh, I'd love to own a brewer or something. It's like, yes, yes, I get it. And mind you, just because they're closed doesn't mean they made great whiskey when they were open. That's another point. They didn't always. There was a lot of bad Port Allen out there. Um, this, whereas these guys don't have the cult-like status. People don't really go gaga over Glen Scotia. Um, they sort of, they, they sort of go, oh, it's sort of like, oh, it's that other distillery in Campbelltown. It's like, oh, that's that other one. They, they do some good whiskey, but, you know, we don't really know them. And I think that's really, I think that's, you're really missing out on something there if you, if you take that approach. This 93.99 is probably one of my favorite whiskeys uh, ever. So, yeah. Now, um, the Nachos of uh, sorry. Lockie asks, Lockie 1997 asks, do you ever have non-panel approved casks? Yes, we do. Andrew used to have lots of them when we we're doing a lot more local panel work um, years ago. Uh, and I have some uh, kicking around the office here, not that many. Um, so it, they come in bottles that look just like this, um, and they would, and they're often samples that were had been rejected by um, the UK panel that we'd often use as just sort of giveaways and bits of fun. We don't really do that so much anymore because um, I've tasted some of the reject casks, and you go, yeah, and there's a reason why that wasn't passed. <laughs> so 
Yes, I sometimes do, but it's um, it's very infrequent these days. Mostly, yeah, they're all approved panel samples already, and um, and up for um, up and about. Yeah. Wow, that just jumps out of the glass. Look at the color on that for something that's a fifteen-year-old uh, refill hogshead. I was talking about color the other night. Like that's actually, I mean, color doesn't tell you much, but that does tell me that out of a refill hoggy, that's had a lot of interaction with the cask. Normally, refill hoggies, they start looking a bit that color instead. So. They're sort of a much more pale. I don't know if you can see the difference. I know they're two different types of glassware, but they're often much more pale and they have a bit more... Um... Ah. That's just pure Campbelltown. It's it's one of those whiskies where it's got that... Uh, and there, there is a character to, the, to that regionality, and I don't like talking regionality too much. I find it almost redundant, but in this case, I'll talk about it. But uh, it often has uh, that sort of... Um... What's the word for it? Uh, Campbelltown whiskey often has that farmyard funkiness, uh, oiliness, um, industrial notes, farm equipment, hay bales, very, very earthy, um, but not always overly peaty, which I love. I mean, I'm not, I love my peated whiskey, don't get me wrong, but when the weather is starting to get like it is now, which is, you know, we are in, um, you know, we're in, you know, almost early November tomorrow. Happy Halloween, everyone, by the way. I'm, I don't really do Halloween, but I, I get it. Um, and you know, they often have that farmyard funkiness to them, which I love. It's so, it feels like a natural whiskey. It doesn't taste overly sweet. It often has a sort of a rich richness from the spirit and the cask, and they make for lovely, lovely whiskies. Ah, 53.5, that is a, uh, sorry, 55.3%. That is a banger, that is lovely. Now, whilst I'm enjoying that, and I've talked too much about that already, Let's talk some paper stuff. I was doing some tidy up earlier, not that you can tell, it's still still junk all over this office. Not that you can, thankfully you can't see it all from your angle. But I can tell you right now that this office right now looks like a bomb hit it. There's boxes of stock over there. There's jars of corks over there. There's uh, the inevitable inbox tray of junk over there. Anyway, um, I was doing some tidy up and I found this, and I want to show you three generations here. Well, two generations, sorry, I should be more accurate. Yeah, no, three, I've got three, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Have a look at this. That's, this is um, uh, the newsletter, the SMWS newsletter. See how that's holding up on the screen there. Um, which is the newsletter of the Scotchmont Whiskey Society, spring 2003. Maybe move that across a bit so you can see that. This is predates unfiltered. And what we used to have in here, this is a marvellous uh, little publication here. Um, what we used to have in here is um, letters uh, and articles from members and from panellists. With all the, the quirky little cartoons on the on the sides and things like that. A drop of Irish, talking about Irish whiskey there. Um, anyway, it was sort of, um, and what I loved about it <laughs> was at the back there were letters um, about... Uh, <laughs> about things happening at society, from, from members, either expressing their delight or their concern. And there was this fantastic letter. I don't know if I've read this one on the live stream before, but if I haven't, I'll have to publish one, this one online. Um, the letter goes, how very sad to see our unique society going the same way as other great British institutions. We have Rolls Royces with BMW engines, Holland and Holland selling ladies clothes, and Savile Row making off the peg suits. Now the SMWS is selling Japanese whiskey. What a mistake. Amazing. And then if we fast forward to now, what I love is that some, some things change, some things don't. We've still got a lovely magazine uh, every every quarter called Unfiltered. I'll hold that one up close. I'm sure for all of our members, you already know this. Of course, you know this magazine well. But if you don't, that's, that's the Unfiltered magazine there. And then, of course, this year, we published our one-off Vault 1682, uh, which was just for people who attended the Vault 1682 dinner. But we're going to be leaking bits and bobs of content from that uh, program this 56 page program uh, online to members over the next few weeks as well as upcoming for out turn um, next week we'll be announcing so out next week is out turn week which is monday um monday the monday the third fourth i can't remember what it is um first is friday so yeah fourth monday the fourth we'll be releasing out turn digitally to all of you via your inbox and we'll make a big song and dance of it online of course and we'll be writing some things up on how to how to make the most of outturn, how to enjoy it, and how to get the how to pick the casks you're after. Finally, tonight, what I want to touch on 
before I wrap up was I mentioned a book the other night. For those who tuned in two or three nights ago where I mixed a bit of um, ginger ale and Glen Scotia together, uh, it was a 93.108 plus uh, a smoky ginger ale. That was good fun. Before, uh, before I did that, um, I mentioned there's a book which I take great inspiration from. Here it is, Whiskey the Manual, an often overlooked book, especially in the world of great whiskey literature. Now that is that is one where it's um, there's there's some great reading in there about how to how to mix whiskey, how to enjoy it. I hope you can all see that all right in the camera there. It's called Whiskey the Manual by Dave Broom. Great book to be honest. It, it sort of goes over some of the more sort of you know, it, it's you know the topic is uh, whiskey. Is, it goes history, history of whiskey, which is great. Uh, whiskey, the essentials, mixing, how to drink it. And how to and what camp it falls into, and then you make some cocktails at the back, um, using using those spirits. Um, why not have a bit of fun with it? That's what it's about. And I've even bookmarked some of the pages of one of the ones, some of the cocktails I've tried to make, and with varying levels of success. But you know, he's you can, he's gone into each detail on each. There's nothing wrong with mixing. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. If the world's best whiskey, whiskey authors and authorities on on spirit use it to mix and have fun with. You can too. Why not? That's what it's about. So that was all for me tonight. I was going to sit back and enjoy this Drambleton Lock, aptly named 93.99. I think there's three or four bottles left online. I honestly, that's guess my vote for, if not easily the Campbelltown Whiskey of the Year, but possibly my my Whiskey of the Year so far. But there's a few more to still to come, obviously, in our turn. So I'm going to reserve judgment and I'll do a big uh, live and video on my favourite casks of the year. Uh, I'd say probably late November, so keep an eye out for that one. Um, so just to answer those questions, Whiskey Sec asks, when's the new Outturn release, man? You'll see you'll get copies of the Outturn arriving in mailboxes as early as Monday, so next Monday, coming up, which I think is the 4th of November, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then you'll get uh, Outturn goes online live for all members at midday, Friday the 15th. So Friday the 15th, it's a mid-month outturn rather than a beginning of month outturn. It's a huge issue for us. It's a bumper issue. It's got 30 plus casks, seven events, five bundles. There's so much in it. There's so much in it. There's a new Heresate. There's a new premium. There's a Vaults collection bottling. There's two malts of the month. Uh, 15th of November, midday 15th of November. Mark your diary. It's on our feed. It's in our Facebook group. It's everywhere. So... Um, thank you, Kathleen. Of course, thank you. That's all from me tonight. Just a 20, 20-ish minute, 25-minute-ish sort of chat with you all about a bit about Campbelltown, learning a bit about it there. Um, hope I hope you've learned a thing or two. The other bottle that I had on my table, which I'm not opening tonight, but one for a little bit later, is the uh, is one of the 27s, also from Campbelltown, that we released uh, in 2018. I think it's 2018. Broadside Cannon Barrage. I'm going to hold that label up. Uh, this one is... Um, do you take after pay? <laughs> Maybe one day, Lockie, but we haven't really looked into it yet. Um, <laughs> so that's the um, 20, 27.112 was that one. Broadside Cannon Brush, a 21-year-old first fill Oloroso. Um, just pitch black in the bottle, that one. I can't, you can't even see through it. It looks delightful. I know this whiskey very well already, but that's a bit of a keepsake. Something to, something to drink in years to come, maybe, um, and see how we go with that. Um, that's all from me at the moment. Like I said, thank you so much for joining in on this warm uh, Thursday night. I'm hosting tomorrow night from uh, the Kirribilli Club uh, for one of their private events. And I would, uh, so therefore, my live stream capabilities might be a bit limited. If I do one, it'll be earlier in the evening probably. Uh, if I don't, it'll be it'll be Andrew. And he's always does a ripper live stream as well. So tune in tomorrow at 8pm. Every single day we're doing a live. Chatting about something different every night, which is amazing. that we, There's so much to talk about. And even if we double back on some of the things we've talked about earlier on, there's always different people listening. It's always a bit of fun. Thanks, everyone. Um, so many regrets. No, no, of course. Look, there's always so many casks, Lockie. You can't grab them all. I know that. I see some come and go, and I go, I wish I'd picked up one of those. But I did pick up one of those because um, that's really something special to me, and there's a lot of work that went into getting that cask. There's this real story behind it. Maybe we can talk about that another night. In the meantime, have a great evening. Cheers.